Asha, Bird of Hope, by Kimberly Long Cockroft, Art, by Marta Antello. Asha arrived on a bright summer day. My new stepsister Beatrice and I leaned over the fence and watched as men carried things into the house next door. Lamps, bookcases, boxes, a green couch. My mom and I moved here to Seattle a month ago when she got married. From the top of the hill where we live, we can see Puget Sound sparkling in the sunshine. When mom first saw the view, she squeezed my shoulder and gasped. Seth, isn't it beautiful? It's like living in a postcard. I nodded because I wanted mom to be happy. She and I walked down to the pier and looked for seals, just the two of us. And when we saw one with his shining black eyes poke his nose out of the water, I felt great. But we don't do much alone anymore because there's always my stepdad and Beatrice tagging along. Now I hoped a kid my age would move into the house next door. A car drove up and Beatrice and I watched an old lady get out. She looked up at the house, adjusted her bright green and orange headscarf, and sighed. We sighed too. No kids. The old lady waved some men over to the car. They nodded, reached inside, and pulled out something tall covered with a sheet. What do you think it is? Beatrice squealed. It could be anything. Suddenly, a shrill voice shouted, Mary, it's cold! Hey, Kasuku! The men jumped and fumbled the thing they held. One of them peeked under the sheet. Is that a... Uh... But we couldn't hear what else he said because just then the voice screeched, Jambo! Jambo! Beatrice pushed away from the fence and headed toward the gate. I'm going to find out what it is. But the old lady and the mysterious thing disappeared into the house, and the door shut behind them. There wasn't anything more to see, so we went down to the beach. All afternoon we sat by the water, watching the boats come and go. Beatrice collected shells in her bucket. She couldn't stop talking about what might be under the sheet. Maybe it's a radio, she said. No, don't think so. Maybe it's a little kid, and the old lady hides him under a sheet because she's kidnapped him. That's crazy. I lay back on the rocky sand, watching gulls circle in the air. A plane blocked the sun for a moment. It left a long white trail against the blue sky as it flew away. I wondered where it had been and where it was going. Suddenly, Beatrice brushed the sand off her hands. Let's go, she said. I followed her back up the hill, straight to the old lady's door. Beatrice knocked. It took a long time for the lady to come to the front door. I hung back. You shouldn't bother her, I said. Why? Beatrice shrugged. Everyone likes me. She will too. Do they now, the old lady said, looking at us. Jambo, hello. Her voice rose and fell like music. We live next door, Beatrice said. Here, these are from our beach. She took a smooth rock out of her bucket and put it in the old lady's hand. Then she took out a clamshell and put it in the lady's other hand. How nice, said the lady. My name is Mrs. Mary Kadima. I'm Beatrice. Beatrice stuck her thumb at me. He's Seth. Where are you from? Kenya, Mrs. Kadima said. In Africa. I've come here to be near my son. He lives close by. He's a doctor. My dad works for the city, Beatrice said. Gas and power lines and trucks and stuff like that. Have you ever ridden an elephant? Mrs. Kadima's eyes crinkled. No, never. Do you have any stuff from Kenya that we could see? Mrs. Kadima smiled. Well, I'm still unpacking, but you're welcome to have a look. A few moments later, we were walking past walls of boxes in Mrs. Kadima's house. She pointed out some large baskets and a brightly colored cloth hanging on the wall. On a table was a photo of her family, standing beneath a low, spreading tree. But we didn't see the mysterious thing anywhere. Mrs. Kadima was showing us a carving of a giraffe when we heard a sharp whistle. It's cold, a voice called. Then we heard a chuckle. Hey, Kasuku! Jambo! Good girl, Asha! Mrs. Kadima laughed. That is something else from Kenya, she said. Or maybe I should say, someone else. Come. She led us into the kitchen. We saw a sheet draped over a chair, the same one that had hidden the mysterious thing. Then we saw what had been underneath. A bird! Beatrice clapped her hands. An African gray parrot, Mrs. Kadima said. In Swahili, 
the word for parrot, is Kasuku. Her name is Asha. Asha means hope. Wow. She was the most beautiful bird I'd ever seen. Soft feathers like tiny waves ruffled her neck. Her wings looked like they'd been dipped in ink, and her tail feathers were as red as strawberries. She turned her head this way and that, fixing me with one black eye, then another. Then she sneezed and, gross, put the tip of a claw in her nostril. Ew, Beatrice shouted. Asha picks her nose. I mean, her beak. Asha opened her beak and barked like a dog. Then she said, Good girl, Asha. Good girl, Asha, Beatrice repeated, poking her finger through the cage bars. Asha fixed Beatrice with an angry stare. Her feathers puffed out. Ha! Not everybody likes Beatrice, I thought. Better not until she gets to know you, Mrs. Kadima warned. Beatrice yanked back her finger just in time. Asha is a very smart parrot, but she doesn't know why she is here in a new place. I've tried to explain. Mrs. Kadima opened the cage door and held out her hand. Kuja Hapa, come here, Asha. I've got some nice green beans for you. But Asha hunkered in the corner of her cage. Five o'clock, time for dinner, James, she called out. Who is James? I asked. He was my husband, Mrs. Kadima said. Asha was his bird. You should have seen the two of them. James would hold her and pet her like a little baby. After James died, we came here. Now Asha doesn't trust me anymore. I stepped closer to Asha. She glanced at me coldly, like a queen in gray velvet robes. Can I feed her? Mrs. Kadima put a green bean in my hand. Be careful. I held out the bean palm up, waiting. Asha lifted one long black claw and edged down her perch. I counted my heartbeats. Come on, girl, I coaxed. Asha looked at me, and for a second, I thought she trusted me. Then she narrowed her eyes. The irises in her eyes got bigger, then smaller. Weird. Suddenly, I felt the brush of feathers, a sharp pain in my hand, and the bean was gone. Oh no, Mrs. Kadima cried, looking at the blood on my hand. Bad bird, Asha. Asha bent her head low over her gray feathers. My hand throbbed, but I felt sorry for her. Now you will never want to come back. Mrs. Kadima clucked her tongue and made me wash my hand. But she was wrong. That afternoon, I read about African gray parrots, how clever and loyal they are. They can live up to 40 years. They never forget a person. And it takes them a long time to get used to a new place. At dinner, Beatrice showed everyone a video clip of an African gray parrot dancing on its perch, saying over and over, spot of tea, spot of tea. That looks like Asha, doesn't it? I shrugged. All African greys look pretty much the same. Mrs. Kadima says that Asha hates it here, Beatrice said. My stepfather shook his head. Water? Mountains? Big trees? Maybe he should have a chat with the seagulls. There's no better place to live. The parrot is a she. I tore open a dinner roll and wedged some butter inside. And maybe she doesn't love it because it's not her home. My mother exchanged looks with my stepfather. Well, it will take her some time to get used to it, I'm sure, she said. That night, I dreamed that Asha was back in Kenya, spreading her wings and flying through thick green trees and vines up to the crown of a mighty tree. The next day, Beatrice and I collected our allowances and walked down to the store at the corner. Then, we knocked on Mrs. Kadima's door. We brought Asha a present, Beatrice said, showing Mrs. Kadima some fruit in a bag. Come in, Mrs. Kadima said. Karibuni, welcome. She'd unpacked all the boxes and beautiful pictures covered the walls. There were tall baskets in the corners, and dark wooden carvings of animals stood on top of an old piano. But we walked straight back to the kitchen. Jambo, Asha, Beatrice grinned, opening the bag. We brought you a snack. She poked some fruit through the cage bars, but Asha turned her back. I pointed to a bare spot on Asha's chest. Is she okay? She's been plucking out some of her feathers, Mrs. Kadima said. She's angry and sad about being here. Then she looked at me. Why don't you try feeding her again, Seth? I don't think she likes me, I said. Last time she took a bean from you, Mrs. Kadima pointed out. She was very rude about it, but she still took it. I picked a shiny plump grape, then opened the cage door very slowly. Hey, Asha, good girl. 
I made low clicking noises. Asha bobbed her head rapidly up and down. I smiled. Funny bird, Asha. Good girl. She hopped down from her perch. She was so close, I could have stroked her feathers. Now her thick, soft feathers were brushing my hand. Oh my, Mrs. Kadima breathed. Asha wrapped her claws around my fingers, bowed her glossy head, and snapped up the grape. I held my breath, afraid to move, afraid to scare her away. I could feel the weight of her sturdy little body, the soft brush of her feathers, and the strong grip of her claws. Just then, there was a knock, followed quickly by the sound of the front door opening. Hello? Someone called. Mom's voice. Time to come home for lunch, kids. Come in, Mrs. Kadima said, and shut the door, please. But it was too late. With a beating of wings, Asha was gone. We dashed outside in time to see Asha flying up high into a pine tree. Nobody could get her down. All the neighbors came out and took turns calling, but that didn't help. Asha hopped from one branch to the next, staring down at us with her smart black eyes. Every time Mrs. Kadima went close, Asha climbed up to another branch. My mother put her hand on Mrs. Kadima's shoulder. I'm so sorry, she kept saying. Mrs. Kadima smiled and shook her head in a worried way. If my husband were here, Asha would fly straight to him. James was good with animals, just like your son Seth. Is Seth's father also good with animals? He was. Seth's father passed away, Mom said. And Mrs. Kadima shook her head again, slowly. I knew Mom was explaining how Dad had been sick for a long time. I'd heard it all a thousand times. I moved through the crowd watching Asha, wishing that I could call her down. Late in the afternoon, my stepdad drove up. What's going on, he said. He looked up at the top of the pine tree. Asha's up there and she won't come down, Beatrice sniffled. She put her hand in mine. Poor Asha. My stepdad looked at me. You're friends with that bird, right? I shrugged. Wait, I have an idea. He pulled out his phone and dialed a number. He winked at me and then spoke into the phone. Hey, Chris, I need a favor. I know you're done with work for the day, but I need you to come down here with your truck. He paused and squinted up into the tree. Actually, it's for a parrot. Yeah, that's right, a parrot. Okay, thanks. He put his phone back into his pocket. My friend Chris is on his way with a bucket truck. He uses it with his crew to cut branches away from power lines or replace bulbs up in streetlights. But I guess this counts as a public service, he grinned. There are perks for working for the city. I tried to smile, but I couldn't. He took off his jacket and handed it to me. You look cold, Seth. Don't worry. Everything will be all right. When the bucket truck arrived, everyone looked expectantly at Mrs. Kadima, but she shook her head. Then she nodded at me. There's only one person here Asha seems to trust. Oh, I don't think, Mom started to say. Yeah, that might not be such a good idea, Chris joined in. That bucket gets up pretty high. He glanced uncertainly at me. But I guess you can't fall out. You're buckled in. And I work the controls from the truck. Still, I'm not so sure. But my stepdad said, I'll take full responsibility, Chris. Nothing to worry about. Seth, are you up for it? I nodded my head. Then go ahead. Mrs. Kadima gave me a bag of fruit, and I climbed into the bucket. Chris clipped a strap to my belt. My stepdad gave a thumbs up and nodded at Chris, who pushed a lever on the truck forward. With a whine, the bucket lifted me up toward the top of the pine tree. I was standing up, holding on tight, with the bag of fruit at my feet. Below me, the crowd of neighbors shrunk until they were blurry and far away. Don't look down, I thought. Don't look down. Think only about Asha. As I rose nearer to the top of the tree, the bucket slowed down. Chris eased me closer to the branch where Asha perched. Then, the bucket stopped. I was suspended just a foot or two away from her. The full, rich scent of pine surrounded us. Is this what it was like to be a bird, quiet and alone at the top of a tree? In the distance, the sunset flooded Puget Sound with glimmering orange. I wondered how many times Asha had watched the sun go down over the broad plains and spreading trees we'd seen in Mrs. Kadima's photos. Jambo, Asha, I murmured. Hey, Kasuku, I can see why you like it up here. How about you and I stay up here forever? She turned her head back and forth, surveying me with a knowing eye. Then again, 
Mrs. Kadima needs you. You don't want her to be lonely, do you? Asha clicked her black tongue. It's cold, Mary, she said. I know it's cold, so why don't you come on down? I reached down for the bag and my stomach lurched as the bucket tilted and swayed. I took out a papaya. Mrs. Kadima had cut it open to reveal black pearly seeds. Come on, girl, I said, showing her the fruit. Aren't you hungry? Jambo, Asha said. Hey, Kasuku, click, click, click. I clicked back at her. Time to go, I said. She unwrapped one claw from the pine tree. My heart fell. If she flew off now, she would probably disappear forever. Time to go, she repeated, turning her head to one side. Good girl, Asha. An evening wind blew up off the water, and the bucket rocked back and forth. I closed my eyes, hoping. Then I felt the cool, dense softness of her feathers. The crowd below erupted into cheers. I heard Beatrice screaming, Yay! Followed by Mom shouting, Be careful! Finally, I heard my stepdad's steady voice. Way to go, Seth. I wrapped my fingers carefully around Asha's body. Under all those feathers, she wasn't very big. She took a big bite of papaya, nipping my finger a bit in the process. Ouch, I said, but kept a tight hold on her. She tucked her head into my shoulder and wiped her beak. Then she lowered her head as if she were bowing. Slowly, I stroked her feathers with the backs of my fingers. Are we friends now, Asha? I whispered. It seemed like she was about to answer. Then she stretched out her neck and barfed papaya onto my jacket. I guess that's a yes, I said, wrinkling my nose. Time to go, she said. Time to go, Kasuku. Slowly, smoothly, the bucket took us back toward the ground, toward Mrs. Kadima and the neighbors and my family. Asha's feathers flattened, and she started to tremble. I stroked her feathers again gently. Don't worry, Asha, I said. We're almost there. We're almost home. Author's Note Many years ago, I knew a parrot just like Asha. As the daughter of a relief and development public health doctor, I began my life in the small country of Bangladesh near India. But it was while I was living in Kenya as a teenager that I met my first African gray parrot. Ituri, which means sweet smelling in Swahili, lived in a spacious cage at my friend Kara Robinson's house. Ituri enjoyed a truly sweet life. He exercised daily, ate lots of fresh fruit, especially sweet papayas, and greeted visitors as they walked in the door. He had a wily, mischievous streak, too. One afternoon as I watched, Ituri thrust his head out between the cage bars and gave Cookie, the Robinson's cat, a sharp nip on the tail. Cookie yowled, hissed, and stalked away. Ituri, hoping for another chance at poor Cookie's tail, cocked his head and coaxed, Here, kitty, kitty, kitty. When we graduated from high school, Kara and I returned to the U.S. for college. Our families moved back over the ocean, too, and so did Ituri. One autumn afternoon, Ituri stretched his wings in his new house in suburban Chicago and flew right out the door to the top of a tall evergreen. Just like Asha, Ituri felt a deep connection to Kara's dad, who unfortunately was away traveling. Though a neighbor ordered a bucket truck, and though many people tried to entice Ituri down from the tree, as night fell, he flew away, never to be seen again. I think I know how Ituri felt. It is hard to move. You can feel as though your body is in one place, but your heart is in another. At least until you begin to feel at home again, like Seth does in my story. I like to think that wily, wonderful Ituri found his way back to warm, sunny climes and lives there still, snacking on tender papayas. <laughs>